magic interests you, I've always been fascinated by it. From the time I was a boy, even now I still make an occasional stop at the neighborhood magic shop to pick up a gadget. For example, today I bought this little container. Open it up and you see what's inside. A small black ball. Now I'll replace the top. And presto, the ball is gone. Passing, isn't it? But actually, it's a sort of mechanical trick that requires no skill at all. Here's another bit of magic that falls into the same category. Anyone can do a trick with the proper equipment. This is apparently an ordinary silk handkerchief. And when I draw it through my hands, it changes color. These are simple little tricks. And there are hundreds more of them. Tricks that famous magi magicians of our time, men like uh, Blackstone and Houdini and Herman, worked out very elaborate illusions. Some of these have become standards, have been used for years in magic acts, and yet they still fool us. There is one that, in which the magician seems to suspend a body in midair. The body appears to float without any support of any kind and a metal ring is passed over and around the suspended body so that it would seem that there is no possibility of any support of any kind. There's another standard, sawing a body in half. The saw is tested for sharpness. The magician's assistant is apparently locked into place in a solid box from which there is no escape. Now the saw begins to cut, and cut through completely so that the box is in two separate parts but the assistant still lives. How are these fantastic things done? How were we fooled? Because we know this isn't real. We know we were fooled. To us today, magic is amusing. Magicians are entertainers, but it wasn't always so. Magic is apparently as old as man himself. It was practiced in temples such as these at least 4,000 years ago amid incense and mysterious sounds and shadows. It had a grim reality for the people of those times that we can understand only if we know something about the world in which these ancients lived. Remember, the ancient world was limited in scientific knowledge. Men didn't know why things happened, not really, but they thought they knew. When trees failed to bear fruit, Ancient man said it was because a demon lived in the tree. But when a frightful storm destroyed crops and uprooted trees, ancient men said it was because the evil spirits were doing battle in the sky. When cattle fell sick and gave no milk and birthed monstrous calves, ancient man said it was because an evil spirit had taken possession of the cow's body. And when men and women lost their senses, went mad, they were said to be possessed by evil spirits. Ancient men believed these things. The ancient man's world was peopled with ghosts and goblins, strange gods and devils, evil spirits and demons. These supernatural beings constantly harried man in his daily life. And man had little protection against them. To be safe, men had to watch the omens. See that little dog going down the street. Your inclination, I imagine, is to smile at the ingratiating little fellow. But this is a yellow dog. And when a yellow dog entered a temple, ancient man believed that this was a sure sign the temple would be destroyed. Here we see an army and navy landing party about to take off on their mission. It has been planned and it will carry through. But if this had been an ancient army and only one man in the party had sneezed, the entire plan would have ground to a halt because a sneeze was an evil omen foretelling disaster. But if an owl, very like this one, had flown over the soldiers or had come to rest on a piece of battle equipment, then a handful of men would have confidently attacked an entire army because an owl was a powerful good omen to ancient men. Ridiculous? To us, perhaps but not to the men of 2,000 years ago. They believed, too, that the spirits foretold the future and gave man advice. Speaking in the murmur of a brook, 
the flash of the lightning and the whisper of rustling trees? How could ancient man defend himself against this multitude of supernatural powers? How could he surely interpret the omens and protect himself? How could he read the future and be prepared? All this was the task of the magician, the sorcerer. These men had the power. These men knew the incantations. They read the future, surely. They exercised, cast out the demons from sick cattle and mad humans. They interpreted the omens and cast spells to counteract them. I'm reminded of a story in the Bible. I'd like to read it to you. Found in the book of Acts. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. This Simon Magnus was a magician. He undoubtedly used tricks to impress people and gain their confidence, Perhaps even the very same simple tricks I've done for you, the disappearing ball. There it is. There it isn't. The handkerchief that changed color. But Simon was not all trickster. He believed that madmen could be healed by exorcising the demons, casting them out, the demons that possessed them. And he was equally sure that it was the gods who made the magic of exercising effective. If Simon could not actually do it himself, if he fooled people, it did not mean that he questioned the reality of such magic in some hands. For when he saw Philip lay hands on the sick and call down the Holy Spirit, Simon did not doubt. He was sure it was so. But it was natural that he should ask to buy the power. He was equally sure that this was magic he could do. To men like Simon, and to those who lived in his day, religion had an inevitable magical quality about it. God gave to his true followers certain rituals which he, God, made magically effective against the demons and evil spirits. Ridiculous, isn't it? What sort of an attitude toward God is this? How could men think of God simply as the greatest magician of all? And yet, stop a moment. Aren't there people you know who attempt to use prayer like a magical incantation? Like a ritual that will make a bicycle appear where there was none before? That will give courage to the cowardly and renewed life to the dying? We forget sometimes all that must go before the moment of prayer. The belief in God, in the power of Christ. We forget that we must give ourselves to him. That we must be ready to accept his will. How many people, like some of these we see here, have you heard say, of course I'm a good Christian. Why, I gave more than $500 to the church last year. Simon offered them money, saying, give me also of this power. He thought he could buy the secrets of their magic. We cannot buy our way into favor with God. We cannot purchase the magic with which to change our lives. And yet, for the true Christian, for the man who truly believes, who with quiet confidence places himself in Jesus' hands, who tries to live as God would have him live, for these there is a changed life, a life that has mysteriously and wonderfully changed.
We in the Salvation Army see it every day on the skid rows of the world. Men like these, changed by the power of God, made whole again. You see it, too, in the men and women who are your friends and business acquaintances. They change, and not by any trick, as Simon thought, but actually as they let the power of God come into their hearts. As the magician himself knows the secret or the explanation to each of his tricks, there is an explanation to those changed lives. It is the power of God, and it's no secret. This mysterious change can be made in your life if you will permit the power of God to work. Then what seems a mystery will become clearly understood. Your life can be changed. God can live in you. The songwriter has said, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. I have ceased from my wandering and going astray, and my sins which were many are all washed away. I am possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure, and no dark clouds of doubt now my pathway obscure. I shall go there to dwell in that city I know. I am happy, so happy as onward I go, since Jesus came into my heart. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought. That change can be wrought in your life if you will permit Jesus to come into your heart. Be with us again next week when, by the magic of television, we will knock at your door. Until then, the Salvation Army sends its three-word benediction to each of you. God bless you. For God is, in very truth, the living word. Amen.